Welcome to the Freelance Tribe. Here we talk with skilled freelancers about their professional journey. Stay tuned for real life experiences to learn and actionable steps to take to improve your freelancing career. My name is Yuri. I'm a community builder at Code Control and 9am.works. And my guest is Jesse Marseille, a sales consultant who got into sales 10 years ago because he enjoyed talking to people and the host of the Storytelling at Scale podcast, where he highlights the human element of entrepreneurship and business. So welcome, Jesse. Thank you so much for having me on, Yuri. It's great to be here. And let's talk about the thing that makes freelancers nervous. It's sales. So tell me, how do you personally feel about sales and what it means for you? Yeah, well, my personal association with sales has changed a lot over the years. So maybe I'll talk a little bit about that trajectory and that evolution and it should help people. So I started where most people start, which is this idea that sales is about convincing somebody to do something. And that's a really uncomfortable way to think about sales, because first of all, you should know people don't like the feeling of being persuaded or convinced of things. Um, they can usually tell and they aren't comfortable with it. And so when you feel like you're trying to convince someone of something, if you're a good person <laughs> who's not like a psychopath, that's going to make you kind of nervous, feel a little bit icky. Um, and so, you know, when I was thinking about <laughs> my early sales jobs, honestly, I wasn't super excited to sell. I just wanted to make money. And I knew yeah. that sales was what I needed to do to make money. The next evolution in my understanding of sales, and I learned this when I got into B2B, into business to business sales, is that sales is about solving problems. And this was a more comfortable place uh, it felt better to fulfill my job as a salesperson when I started to look at it this way. Um, because when you're solving a problem, you get this feeling that you might actually be able to help somebody with something. And I think that's pretty empowering and it changes it from trying to persuade someone to something where it's more about problem solving collaboratively with another person. And that's good. And that carried me for a few years. I felt better about sales. And then in the last few years, I've actually shifted to a different understanding of sales. Hmm. And this one is that sales is the transference of belief. And this is my favorite new way to look at sales. And what I mean by this is sales happens when you truly believe that your product or your service can drive a certain outcome for somebody. And if you hmm. truly believe that and you have a conversation with somebody about their situation and about how your service or product might fit into their environment, they're going to feel from you that you believe it, that you're an honest person. And if they need your solution, they're going to take on that feeling of belief. And what about being misguided? For example, if you believe that they need your products and services and they don't need it really. Yeah, that's a really good question. So here we're going to get into the details of the word uh, or of the sentence. So you have to believe that your product or service can help. That does not mean that the other person actually has to want your product or service. And so it's your job as a salesperson to find or to build a product that is so good, that is so undeniable that you believe it. At that point, your work is done. It is not your job to convince somebody that they need it. It's your job to communicate your belief that it helps and they are then going to choose to do what they want with it and they have every right to either accept it or to reject the solution. It sounds like building an iPhone. So nobody really is persuaded to buy it, but people like, oh, I will buy a new one. Like, because they are also focused on building their product and just communicating about it in different, different ways. And I wonder what part of sales is building relationships? Yeah, I mean, building relationships is big. And I think, 
for a lot of people, it feels unnatural to build a relationship that's based on a business outcome. It feels kind of inauthentic. But then at the same time, you go to your customers and you go, okay, sales is about relationships. I'm going to build relationships. Well, now this person's just my friend. How do I turn around? Like, I wouldn't try to sell something to my friend, right? So there's kind of a balancing act there. Um, I think that it's important to know that salespeople should be likable. Hmm. You should be somebody that people want to talk to. But at the same time, the customer should be buying the product or service, not buying you as a friend. Hmm. How to do that? How to um how to not how how, how not to become friends? <laughs> it's a crazy well, question, but yeah. Yeah, it's okay if you get on friendly terms, but I think especially in a in a business context, um if you focus too much of the conversation on you know how are your kids what are you into have you been playing sports what kind of exercise do you do at the gym at a certain point it becomes a little bit disingenuous because the reality is if that person didn't move to the next meeting with you or move forward in the sales process you wouldn't keep talking to them so you don't want the foundation of the relationship to be entirely personal in nature you do want it to be focused on business I can imagine that like, you know, you're moving a client through a pipeline and then at some point they stopped to answer you like, oh, okay, I won't ask you about your kids anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So they weird. Can feel that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what skills are crucial for making good sales? Yeah, there's a couple. So on kind of tactical or logistical level, you need to understand commercials you need to understand business and so we, we might call that commercial acumen or business acumen and what i mean by that is you need to understand the business environment that your customer is in and there's a few factors that are really important for you to have awareness of so the first is what is the nature of the problem that they have how do they measure the impact of that problem so is it well, this problem is causing us to spend an extra 10 hours a week on something. Okay, well, what's the cost of those 10 hours per week that you're spending? Is it 10 hours to fix the problem uh, from someone who only makes $20 an hour? Well, in that case, that's only $200. Or is it 10 hours of an executive time, of an executive's time who's a $200 an hour employee? So you need to understand who's involved, what the problem is, and how the impact of the problem is being measured. That's very, very important for you to build credibility and to be able to have a collaborative business discussion with your customer. The other aspect of this outside of the business logistics is the soft skills or the social skills. Um, I think there are people that are more naturally inclined to relationship buildings and having conversations. So some of it is innate or kind of their natural inherent abilities, but some of it can be taught. And one of the really important things is to know that asking good questions and making sure that your customer is talking is really important. Nobody likes to be lectured at. So you should leave a lot of space for your customer to talk. How do you think what is better for freelancers being great communicator and medium expert or being an amazing expert but like mediocre communicator yeah it's a really good question i think it depends on what you're trying to sell so there are certain products that are extremely technical in nature that if you are not at a high level of technical aptitude, your buyers are going to become suspicious of you. And it doesn't matter how good you are at relationships, they're just not going to trust that you actually have a solution that can help them. So you should, as a freelancer, you should think about how technical your product is and what level of aptitude you have to have there. The other thing is certain products are more, the sales process is faster paced Usually this is when the product or the service is a lower cost. So if you're selling something that only costs maybe a hundred bucks or 50 bucks, whatever it might be, 
your ability to create trust and relationship quickly is more important than your technical aptitude. Okay, and what about Zuri's example, some big corporate organization, and they just want to delegate some stuff. For example, they have a team, but it's hard to, they, their team is busy with some other stuff and they want to hire freelancers. I don't know, a few, a few freelancers to make a quick solution, to do something very, really fast and also, it's some crucial part. So it's not like, you know, something they just buy and forget about it. So it, they will buy it and they will use it for years and it will be like part of their huge business. So how to act in this situation as a freelancer? How to build your credibility with this kind of clients? Yeah, I mean, building credibility with clients requires a couple of things. It requires producing results and it requires really good communication. So the result is going to come from what you are actually doing on a working basis for your customer. Um, it's how you run that process and the outcomes that that process generates for them. But the other side of it is, are you communicating and sharing the journey of your working engagement with your customer in a way that helps them trust you and want to continue working with you because sometimes freelancers go in this situation where they do their work but it's kind of a black box or it's behind closed doors to the customer and the customer needs to feel awareness in order to trust how you're driving those results so this might come in the form of a weekly check-in call it might come in the form of monthly reporting on data that's relevant to your working engagement but it's very important that your customer has a view into how you do work and that you're willing to talk through with them how that work is being achieved, what obstacles you're running into, what you need from them in order to drive even better results. I feel like it's when you're already working on a project, for sure. Mm -hmm. And how to get on this kind of projects? Oh, yeah. I mean, so this is where your portfolio comes into play. And if you're an artist or a musician, you know, you're very used to having a portfolio of your work. You're a photographer, you have a website, shows a bunch of images, whatever it might be. In the business space, I find that people are surprisingly um, amateur in how they present their portfolios and how they put them together. I think they just kind of assume like, well, I've got this resume and it shows where I worked over the last 10 years or whatever it is. That should be enough for people to trust me. And the reality is when customers are evaluating you, they don't care how long you've actually worked in the field. There are people that might only be in a field for five years, but they are highly talented and they do much better than people that have been in the field for 20 years. So I wouldn't count on your experience alone or the amount of experience you have as being enough to build that credibility. What's really important is that you show the work that you've already done. And as a sales leader and a corporate manager and all of that, I've made purchasing decisions to, you know, I've worked with freelancers and vendors just based off of the quality of their portfolio without even talking to them very much. Hmm. I mean, really, if I can see the work, then I'm going to trust it. So if you're a freelancer, I would spend a lot of time on your portfolio. What kind of portfolio can be for a developer? Um, an ad developer, like somebody that's putting out um, like Facebook or LinkedIn ads. I mean, like Google. application developer, like a programmer. Oh, an app developer, yeah, app yeah, developer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm not a developer myself, so someone's going to have better insight into this. But I know that GitHub and other websites like that are important for showcasing your work. I mean, I think a website is still really good. Like having a solid website is kind of the new resume so yeah you should have examples of your work that you can show so okay it's uh, I, be, I believe it works when clients reaching out to you but what if you are looking for projects so how to code outreach clients in this way that you are still credible but also you don't sound salesy while proposing your uh, services yeah this is where lead magnets come into play um so a lead magnet is basically a asset a resource of some kind 
that you can share with potential customers that provide value to them while also showing your credibility. So when I was a full-time sales leader before I did the podcast um, and I was selling sales consulting services, I built frameworks for coaching salespeople on how to write emails or how to do cold calls. And I would share those frameworks with my buyers, with my customers. So I was selling to sales enablement leaders, people that put on sales training. I was selling services that helped them put on that training. And so I needed to demonstrate that I was capable of running a training exercise in the areas they cared about, email, cold call, discovery meetings, how to negotiate, this kind of thing. So rather than just email someone or call them up and say, hey, I'm a sales trainer, I wanna help you put on training. What I did is I created resources that would help them do their job, make their life easier, but also demonstrate that I know what I'm talking about. And so when I would reach out to them, through an email or a LinkedIn DM, I would say something along the lines of, hey, Yuri, I saw that you recently hired a few people to your sales team. It sounds like you're gonna have a new onboarding initiative this year to get their skills up to speed. I wanted to share this guide that I made for you about cold calling. As you know, cold calling is a critical skill for any new sales hire. Hopefully this helps you out. Let me know what you think. And yeah. when they would read this guide, Either they would say, eh, you know what, I'll do the training myself, or they would go, you know what, this is pretty good. This person, Jesse, seems to know what they're talking about. I'm going to have a, a larger conversation with them. And also, I feel like even if you are given this value upfront, even if they won't work with you, you are still on their mind and they can come back to you at some time, or maybe they will find somebody who also in need of such services and they went, oh, I remember this person, Jesse, he shared with me and made them uh, materials. Like I, I, will, I would recommend him. Yeah, absolutely. And people share those materials around. I think that's kind of what you're saying. And so it's a great way to get referrals as well. Yeah. So how and what AI tools do you use to improve your sales? It's a good question. And this has changed over the years for me. So in the beginning, I didn't use any AI tools. I I mean, they didn't even exist when I started sales, right? So definitely was <laughs> not an option for me to use artificial intelligence. Um, but even after ChatGPT was released, I generally focused on just making calls, reaching out to people on LinkedIn, that kind of thing. As the technology got better and applications for sales improved, I started experimenting more with AI tools. Um, and as a sales leader, I hired freelancers and vendors that could set up AI tools for our outreach campaigns. So one of the ones that's really good is something like Clay, um, which is essentially a smart spreadsheet that allows you to find data, process that data and transform it into customized outbound messaging at scale. This is really good in a, in an environment where someone is highly skilled with this technology. For a freelancer who maybe is an expert in something else, but not necessarily an expert in sales tech stack, I would recommend with starting something much simpler, um, such as a tool like Salesfinity, which has mm -hmm. some AI features rolled into it, but it's basically cold calling software that allows you to call um, your potential prospects. That can be good. I mean, the other thing is I don't think you necessarily need to use that many AI tools yourself if you're using social media to build your brand. This is something I tell people all the time and they get a little surprised by it, but you should remember that LinkedIn, Facebook, these different companies, they have artificial intelligence rolled into their recommendation algorithm. So yeah. if you learn how to use those platforms to market yourself, you're actually getting the advantage of artificial intelligence, but you don't even need to drive the tool. You just need to do your posting. So I think that's an important thing for people to recognize. What is one important and not obvious LinkedIn tip you can give those freelancers who wants to build their brand there? Yeah, okay. The obvious one first, you have to post every day. Straight up, you just have to post every single day. There are... Creators out there that maybe don't post every day, blah, blah, blah. That's fine. There's exceptions. 
if you are building your brand and your goal is to be able to sell through LinkedIn, you must post every single day. That's how you build momentum with the algorithm. And it's also just how you get better. You need to get in the practice of writing posts that drive engagement. And the only way to do that is to just do a bunch of posts. When I started, my posts were terrible. I didn't like them. They didn't get that much engagement. But over time, you collect feedback and you edit them and you refine how good you are. Um, and they always get better. And what is one not obvious advice? <laughs> the not obvious one. Okay, you pushed me on the not obvious one. Um, so templates work. There are templates for writing LinkedIn posts that will show you what a good hook is. So like that first sentence to get people's attention and then how to format the post. They like to use a lot of line breaks in between sentences. So there's a lot of empty white space on the post. Um, LinkedIn really likes lists. So, mm -hmm. you know, here's 10 tips that I learned during my first year as a business development manager, whatever it might be. So I would actually use templates in the beginning to kind of learn that structure. But the thing you then have to remember is that templates are very predictable and people will know that you're using templates. So after a few months of using templates and getting used to them, then you should start to write posts on your own following your instincts, not using the templates. And you'll still be influenced by what you learned from the templates about structure and the flow and the sequence of, of sentences and paragraphs within the post, but you won't have to follow it so strictly. The more you practice, the more you'll get better. <laughs> Definitely, totally. Yeah. And you know, Jesse, I have so many questions and I wish to have the sky is the limit, but time is the limit to our conversation. So the final question, what is your favorite food? <laughs> My favorite food, sushi. Gotta be sushi. Love sushi. Got it. Welcome to the sushi team. Okay. So yeah, Jesse, thank you so much for sharing your experience. And it's been such a pleasure to hear and learn from you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Yuri. And thank you so much for listening. If you like the show, hit the like button on five stars and share it with your friend. That's it. We're done. See you in the next episode.